Welcome to this presentation. My name is Yevi Jönsson, and I'll present uh, this paper, Steel Frames Analyzed by Use of Advanced Displacement Mode-Based Beam and Joint Elements. Uh, this paper is part of Anna Spau Hansen's uh, PhD thesis, and we have written this paper together. Okay, so uh, let me start off. The uh, basic idea is to use advanced beam elements uh, for uh, the beam parts uh, and then make a joint interface to a model of the joint. And the joint model is a finite element based model uh, which where we use triangle elements. So the advanced beam elements are based on generalized thin wall beam theory and uh, we uh, are able to include distortion and warping in these elements. Okay, uh, so let's start out describing the generalized thin wall beam theory. The beam theory is uh, developed as a one dimensional theory where uh, we can describe the cross section as thin walls and we introduce a local coordinate system and S system uh, for each wall element describing the cross section. The cross section shape is the same all the way along the beam. So the beam displacements are modeled uh, by separation of displacements into cross section displacements multiplied by magnitude functions. So the cross section displacement consists of in plane uh, and out of plane displacements. The in plane uh, describes what happens in the plane of the cross section, W, S along the section, and W, N normals of the section, whereas the warping is described by omega uh, values, and we can also describe the warping to the cross section. Let's now not go too much into these details. The cross section modeling is performed by uh, discretizing the cross section into wall elements. So the cross section wall elements, uh, like a beam element, except that it has uh, six degrees of freedom at each end, corresponding to a, a space uh, node. Um, these describe what happens with the cross section. And this description is performed uh, in between the nodes, we have an interpolation of the displacements. The nodal functions are multiplied by the actual variation functions, the phi functions, and they uh, can be added up uh, with different constants, which are the amplitudes, uh, which are the constants of each mode, part of each mode. So we have this modal description uh, of the cross section. Using uh, this displacement uh, description, we can use the interpolation functions to integrate the cross section mat matrix uh, description of uh, the differential equilibrium equations. So K0, K1, K2 here is, for example, matrices of stiffnesses of cross sections, uh, which depend on the displacements, uh, respectively the in-plane and out-of-plane displacements of U, the nodal ones here, and we can sum them up for the whole cross section. So this is for the cross section and the nodal displacements, and they are functions of set. And we would like to find out what are these modes and can we find a modal solution for these? So we have discretized the cross section and now we are seeking exact solutions of these differential equations. So the solutions to these differential equations are, we are guessing uh, dimensional solutions, but the eigenvalue problems gives us 12 zero eigenvalues. These correspond to 12 uh, polynomial beam modes. The first uh, six modes uh, sh shown here, uh, uh, to the left uh, are the uh, rigid body modes, translation to one side, uh, the translation upwards, the extension, pure extension, the pure rotation of the whole beam, or we can also have the next one, mo uh, the mode five is also translation and variation along the set described by the first uh, two lines here. Uh, and uh, next we have uh, the following modes, linear strain modes describing uh, the linear variation modes. We have pure bending modes. We have uh, constant shear modes. 
And these all describes what happens with the polynomial functions. We can visualize these functions uh, instead of writing, showing them like this, we can show them like this. So these are the 12 polynomial uh, B modes, which are what we are used to seeing. The other solutions are the exponential solutions. We get eigenvalues for them. And we have real and complex eigenvalues. Of, uh, we have exponential torsion and distortional modes. So the, the upper uh, two rows here are the um, in-plane displacements, which are can be, uh, if they are complex, we are show the two solutions. Uh, upper one, the real solution, the real uh, shape, and the second row, uh, the imaginary shape. Uh, below we have here we have the uh, we have the uh, whopping modes shown corresponding to them. So column-wise, mode 13, 14, and so forth are all the modes, and. Uh, they're complex, and there are, since it's a quadratic eigen problem we're solving, uh, we get twice as many as we need for assembling the elements. So we have to pick out some of these modes. Okay, each mode varies exponentially. Mode 13, like this, and we can see this is the torsional or warping part, which uh, has an exponential variation uh, or hyperbolic variation along the length, and typically goes quite a big part of it. Then we have the following warping modes, which die off, and the higher the mode number, the shorter the length scale uh, we get. So 20, mode 23 is only about 11, 12, 10% from the end, which is affected by end disturbances. Okay, so how do we model the joint? We model the joint um, using triangle elements uh, and uh, with, uh, six degrees of freedom and each node. So it's a constant strain triangle in plane and uh, more or less constant uh, bending modes uh, for the triangular interface. So we assemble the model, we have beam elements and we also have these uh, joints and we match the nodal interface discretization. So there are the same amount of nodes placed the same place. And the displacement interpolation should be compatible between the joint and the advanced beam elements. Okay, so it's not just a one node, it's a lot of nodes which we fit together at the interface. Okay, we have found the stiffness matrix, conventional uh, stiffness matrix of the beam element with a lot of nodes at each end and also of the joint. Um, so instead of using the conventional uh, uh, degrees of freedom, we would like to use the B modes as the degrees of freedom. So we transform uh, the interface degrees of freedom into a modal degrees of freedom. We do that by assembling in the upper matrix here, U is equal to W multiplied by phi. The W matrix are the the modal shapes of the cross section uh, organized in, in order. And we can use this as transformation. We can use all the modes or just part or reduce part of the modes. And this transformation will still be uh, good enough and do what we want to. So we use the transformation of the end section nodes uh, of, the, of the beams and, and transform the uh, degrees of freedom of each end to the modal degrees of freedom, same we do for the joint and we are trained KB tilde and KB KJ for the joint uh, tilde. And we can assemble in a system matrix with where the unknowns or the degrees of freedom are the modal shapes at the interfaces, plus perhaps some internal degrees of freedom of the joints. Okay, so here, we solve this problem and now we can see an example of this frame corner. Uh, and we can see that a load a frame corner, we have some, uh, some boundary condition, simple condition, uh, simple supports at the middle of the section, uh, at the corner and at the two ends. And uh, we have uh, these uh, 
these supports are possible since we have interfaces or joint interfaces at each end of the, both ends of the beam. Um, okay, so doing the calculation, we can find the mode intensity or the, we can find the degrees of freedom or the values of the degrees of freedom, which are the modal degrees of freedom. And, and we can take out the ones for the interface, the first upper interface between the corner and the upper beam and draw the values or the intensities of these. And we can see that the first nodes have a large influence and the next modes reduced. So at the lowest line here, we can see uh, weekly see uh, the displacement modes, the first one, two, and three incorporate. These are the translational degrees of freedom. We have rotation, we have the warping, and we have distortion also in doing this. And it would be interesting to use a reduced number of degrees of freedom. We can do the same type of analysis for different frame corners and we get more or less the same type of effects. Um, these uh, one special corner, which we have also analyzed is this uh, assembly or frame assembly between beam elements, beam tubes, um, where we uh, can see that there is no internal stiffness so that we need plate action to transform further forces, meaning there's a lot of local plate bending, meaning that we need to introduce many more modes uh, to describe this. We can see that many more modes participate in at the interfaces. Okay, so just to conclude uh, on this short talk, the or have some discussion, only the degrees of freedom of the beam ends are used when using exact solutions, which means that we have very few degrees of freedom. Interface mode reduction can be used, reducing the number of degrees of freedom even more. Uh, using these beam modes as interface modes is justified because they are related, uh, they justified by the actual part of the warping of the beam. The beam has a lot of stiffness along the walls. Um, so that if this is transferred to the joint, this works very well. Uh, including modes according to decreasing length scales is a natural choice since it corresponds to increasing finite element discretization. Interface mode reduction has to be used with caution when out of plane plate action dominates the behavior as the last example between the tube connections. Internal degrees of freedom of the joint can be eliminated in displacement analysis. The method has potential for use in large frames. Thank you for listening and you're welcome to ask questions.